One of the most interesting and really innovative aspects of this, this work, The Consolation of Philosophy, in Boethius' analysis about goods and the nature of happiness, is not only that he shows that, that these don't really satisfy the way that we often take them to and we're not thinking as clearly as, as we ought to, but that he, he takes the problem and pulls it deeper and deeper into what has genuine being, what is going to ultimately be a kind of unity. And that casts a light backwards onto all these other goods so that we can put them into proper perspective. So where we're going from this, this big question mark over here, is ultimately going to be, and I'm going to let you in on the secret right now, it's ultimately going to be God, but God in, in a, understood in a philosophical way as something that we can not only acknowledge or, you know, pray to, or, but also participate in, something that we can be like by having uh, the right orientation, by trying to cultivate virtue. And that is going to put all these other things into their right perspective. Boethius doesn't deny, actually, that these are, in fact, to some degree, goods. They're just not stable goods. They're not the kinds of goods that we should ultimately be resting everything on. How are we going to get there? Well, we want to see how this actually goes. You notice that I've got this word means up there, and then in parentheses, ends. So when we talk about ends and means, what we really mean are... What means do we need to get to our ends? What do, I what do we identify as the ends, the goals, the purposes, the values that we are striving after? So Boethius is going to look at each one of these in turn and ask, is it the good? We've already seen him do some of that. Um, and, and now he wants to make it a little bit more encompassing, more universal, global. He's asking about... What is it we're really after with these things? And if we pay attention to individual people, or we look at classes of people, some people actually do desire wealth. That seems to be their fundamental motivation. We can ask about them, what are they really doing? What are they after? And we notice that the answer was, what they really want is self-sufficiency. And the main problem with wealth is that it can't really provide us with self-sufficiency. We saw that... If you want to be wealthy, you have to do a lot of things, and you have to make a lot of sacrifices, and then even after you have the wealth, you've got to keep spending more wealth just to hold on to the wealth that you have, and it doesn't, you know, take care of fear, it doesn't take care of the fact that you're going to die someday. Um, it's the same thing with power. Power actually depends on, you know, a sort of powerlessness uh, of other people, and perhaps even, you know, replicates it within yourself, and it can't ultimately satisfy fame. Same thing. In this, this section, in book three, he's also going to consider uh, pleasure and friendship. I almost said treasure. <laughs> I suppose that would be when you have pleasure and friendship both rolled in together. We can make up a new word. And here's what's really interesting. We can look at these in a number of different ways. We can say that for any given person, these are their, their ends. This is what they value most. This is what they will sacrifice for. And then we're treating each one of these as an end. But we can also say, yeah, but why are they? Why, why does this guy want to heap up all this money? Why is that person going after political office? What do they want to get out of it? And Boethius notes that there can be a, a, a sort of confusion and a cycling around throughout all of this because we might want wealth in order to be famous or we might want wealth in order to buy friends. We might want wealth in order to buy things that we find pleasure in. You know, it could be anything from, you know, collecting stamps to um, using hard drugs and everything in between, right? Um, we, similarly, we might want power. Some people want to seek power just so they can use it to make a ton of money. Other people want power so that they can become famous. Other people want power so that they can help out their friends. And we could go through each of these. Any of them can become a means or an end for the other one. That should show us something there. This is, these are shifting sands. These are not things that are completely stable. And we've seen what the dynamics are with wealth and power and fame. Let's look at what he actually has to say about, about friendship. Boethius says that there's no support in friends that you acquire because of your good fortune, 
rather than your personal qualities. So if you're buying your friends, or you've got your friends because of power, or people are hanging out with you as sort of an entourage because you're famous, or because you're supplying them with pleasure, watch out when you lose those goods of fortune, because those friends are going to disappear. They're not going to be your friends forever. And if you haven't cultivated the kinds of good qualities that you actually need in order to be a good friend, in order to be somebody who other people would want to be with for, for their own sake, then that friendship is not going to be something very stable either. It's not going to be something that can provide you with security. As a matter of fact, you know, there's all sorts of stories about people that we call false friends. What about pleasure? He says, a bodily pleasure, there's really nothing to say. Its pursuit is full of anxiety and its fulfillment full of remorse. So let's, let's actually think about that for a minute, though. Bodily pleasure is full of remorse and the pursuit is full of anxiety. What are the sorts of things that he's talking about? What are the things that we take bodily pleasure in? We like to eat. Eating involves not only, you know, filling up the belly when we're hungry, but we like the taste of things as well. We like to drink, drink things, coffee, tea, Coke. Um, I like beer and wine. Um, what else do people enjoy? Well, the beer and wine is a good example. And I suppose actually the coffee, tea, and, and Coke is, are great examples too, because that's, you know, caffeine, so there's a stimulant. We like the effects that certain things have on us besides just the taste. We like the, the charge that we get from the caffeine. We like the perhaps excitement or the mellowness that alcohol initially a stimulating effect and a sort of opening effect. It's great for brainstorming, they say. Uh, afterwards, a depressing effect. People like other things as well. Um, those are all bodily pleasures. What else do we enjoy? We like laying around and sleeping in and sunbathing and... You know, floating in the pool, sitting in the hot tub, those are, those are nice things. Massages, those are all sort of in the, the realm of comfort. Um, we enjoy sexual pleasure as well, uh, unless you're ahedonic, which, you know, is an actual, you know, disordered state. You enjoy that sort of thing. Um, you know, we could multiply things. We, we enjoy engaging in sports, you know, in activities where we're moving our bodies around. That feeling of motion is something we like. Some people like getting on roller coasters and getting, getting scared, right, or going to haunted houses. That, that's, in, in a certain sense, a bodily pleasure. So we can talk about all sorts of examples like this. Now, is their pursuit full of anxiety? It really depends on the kinds of pleasures that we're seeking. Certainly, you're probably going to have to give up some wealth in order to get many pleasures in today's economy, aren't you? And some of them could be full of remorse. Let's take sexual pleasure for, for an example. Are there, you know, if, if you had no restrictions whatsoever on how to attain sexual pleasure, if society didn't care about how you did it, if you didn't feel any sort of sense of shame about what you did, then I suppose there wouldn't be any remorse, now would there? It's interesting because there's a, a philosopher, uh, a cynic, Diogenes, who was caught um, getting off of the marketplace, and his response to all the people who were saying, what a degenerate you are, was, if only I could rub my belly and, and make hunger go away so easily. But most people aren't like that, are they? Most of us have some sense of propriety, and there's certain limits. And it could be tempting to cross those limits. This is how people get in trouble, isn't it? I know I shouldn't flirt with this person over here, but it makes me feel good. And it's making them feel good, too. And then somebody finds your text messages, right? Who, who is this person? Now, suddenly, there's all sorts of problems. Uh, doing that, that, pursuing that pleasure didn't actually provide you with some sort of stable uh, good, you could say. And it may actually result in the loss of these sorts of things. Great examples of those sorts of things. Um, again, if we want to talk about sexual pleasure. Um, recent cases, uh, Anthony Weiner, uh, Elliot Spitzer, losing power. Um, Brett Favre, his fame is tarnished because of his uh, sexting scandals. People pay out money to, to blackmailers. And we could go on and on with all sorts of other pleasures. If you're a glutton, you have to spend a lot of money. 
Um, if you, you know, become addicted to drugs, uh, all these things can, can get lost, can't they? So pleasure can be problematic. Um, it can't provide us with the, uh, the happiness that we want. But we just goes a little further, though, and he says, if bodily pleasure can give us happiness, there's no need to deny that animals are totally happy because all they really do is seek out the fulfillment of their bodily needs. He says, the pleasures, some pleasures are actually what he calls honest pleasures. That means pleasures that we indulge in, and they're the kinds of pleasures that we ought to pursue. The pleasures derived from a wife and children are examples of that. But there's a story all too natural that a certain man found his children tormentors. So, you know, um, the things that we originally think are going to give us pleasure may turn out not to give us pleasure. So over here we have all these sorts of things. They are genuine goods. What is it that we're after? Are we just, you know, using one of these to get another one of these? Are we just exchanging them for each other? Or is there something bigger? Is there a, a more fundamental need that we human beings are trying to satisfy? Uh, we just thinks there is. And he's talked about it in terms of self-sufficiency. He has also talked about it in terms of satisfaction of desire. A state of self-sufficiency would be a state in which we're actually satisfied. We are content because we've had what we need, and we've got more of it if we need it. We have a secure possession of the good. None of these things can actually provide us with that, but in every one of them, this is what we're seeking. And what are we really seeking? What does this really comprise? That's really about this conception of happiness. Now, you might say to yourself, well, happiness is super easy to get. You just go and get a chocolate bar or a balloon or listen to a song, you know, say the happy song, right? That'll help you. Um, but that's not what he means by happiness. And when we're talking about happiness in a philosophical sense, we mean something more than just a momentary state. We mean a way of being. Uh, the Greek word for that was eudaimonia. Um, the Latin word is beatitudo. We get beatitudes from that. And the notion is that if you're really happy, it's something that is going to go on for a long time. It's going to be um, uninterrupted. It's going to be something that actually is secure. Once you're truly happy, it's not something that can be easily taken away from you. Now, that puts things in a different perspective, doesn't it? If we say, when we're looking for these things, what we really want is happiness. What we really want is something like this, and that's how we understand happiness. But here we get to a key, a key point. What do we think happiness is? Do we, do we have just sort of a, a rosy imagination of it? We've never really given it much thought. We're just so busy going after this sort of stuff. We're just trying to keep our head above water that we never worry about what we're actually aiming for what we're trying to attain, we probably should think about this. There should come a time during every person's life where they say, am I really happy? What would it take to make me happy? What the hell is it to be happy? I'm not even quite sure. And, you know, if you, if you don't do this, sooner or later you will actually have crises during your life. Um, oftentimes these happen at the midpoint, which is why they're called midlife crises. But some people have them in their 20s. Some people have them in their 30s. Other people continue to have them throughout their life. And they want to know what is actually going to make me happy. What will fulfill me? What will be a meaningful existence? And you can try to shove as much of this stuff into that question, into the hole opened up by that question, and it may not fill it up. You can buy as much stuff as you like, with retail therapy. You can acquire absolute power over other people. You can become famous. You can become a celebrity and still not actually be happy. So the issue is, what conceptions of happiness do we actually have? Do we have false conceptions of what it is to be happy? Boethius doesn't worry about it in this respect, but one thing that we probably ought to think about in the 21st century is, are we getting fed false ideas about what happiness is? Through advertising, through our culture, 
through other people that surround us who have got their, themselves mixed up with these sorts of things and would like to see us as mixed up as them. Those are valid concerns. What would be the true conception of happiness? Here we actually have to do a bit of thinking. That's a question mark. And what, if we want to fill this in, we have to work our way towards it. So what Boethius is going to do is he's going to try to think about what might actually make us truly happy. And he says, um, what would it be? What would we need to have? He says, all of these roads to happiness are sidetracks, things like wealth, pleasure, the, the satisfaction of desires for power, for even some desires for security. They cannot bring us to the destination they promise. Why? Because they also bring along other problems. You know, for example, if you, if you want to hoard money, you have to take it by force. If you want to have high office, you have to grovel before people and kiss a lot of your rear end, as they say, in order to get the power that you want. Um, well, what would be true happiness then? He says, self-sufficiency is part of that. And now he's talking back and forth with philosophy. And she says, if there were a thing that were self-sufficient, able to accomplish what it wants from its own resources, glorious, worthy of uh, reverence, surely that being would be supremely happy. Let's think about this for a moment. What's she saying there? What the person who wanted wealth or power wanted was to be self-sufficient. Oops. Not even self-sufficient as far as spelling goes. To be able to accomplish everything from their own resources. To actually be famous, but to be rightly famous. To be famous for the right reasons. And here's where it gets really interesting. Philosophy tells us that this is a unity, a oneness. All of these things are actually the same because they're all combined in one thing. She goes on to say human perversity, human mistakes, makes divisions of that which by nature is one and simple. And each one tries to grab a separate part of it. And when they do that, the parts don't add up to the whole. So going after wealth, for example, uh, or going after power, this being would in fact have power. But the power that this being has as part of you know, what it is, is not the same thing as power in isolation. Power in isolation is less powerful than the power that this being, this unity has. So um, she goes on and she says, it's impossible to find happiness among these things which are thought to confer each of the desired states individually, like wealth, power, fame, all of those sorts of things. So um, what is this then? Boethius says, even a blind person could see it, and you revealed it when you were trying to show the causes of false happiness. Unless I'm mistaken, true and perfect happiness is that which makes a person self-sufficient, strong, worthy of respect, glorious, and joyful. So we got to add a few other things here. Strong. Joyful. All of these comprise a unity. 
Now that's a hard thing to find, isn't it? What being would there be that's totally self-sufficient, able to accomplish whatever it accomplishes from its own resources, glorious, worthy of reverence, strong, joyful? What could that be? Well, you know, for Boethius, this is actually going to be God. God is a unity of all of these things. God or the divine. And he says, human uh, goods are only shadows of the true good or imperfect blessings, and they cannot confer true and perfect good. So, um, what is this then? They, they actually have an uh, interesting passage in one of the things of, of praying. So the, the question that he turns to then, and this is still in book 3, this is in chapter 10, is where are we going to find this? Well, why is this going to be God? Because we can't conceive of anything that is superior, that is greater than God. Because God is this. This is what it is to be great and to be supremely great. To surpass all other things. Now that raises some problems for us, doesn't it? If we're all about our happiness and God enjoys this and God has all this stuff, that's great for God. How does that help us? How does that give us any of what we actually need as human beings? Well, if we go on and we, we look at this um, a little bit further, the question then is how can we, let me put it on the board, how can a human enjoy the happiness of God? That's a really valid question. Human beings are imperfect. We've already seen that we're all screwed up when it comes to the nature of what is happiness. We make stupid mistakes. Our cultures, our societies teach us uh, mistaken viewpoints on what happiness is. We, we subject ourselves to these goods of fortune when there's really only one thing that is actually enjoying happiness. How do we make that our own? How do we come to enjoy happiness? Well, she says, um, everything that's good is so through participation in goodness. So enjoyment comes through participation. So it's not like enjoying God would be like enjoying a candy bar where you consume it, and it becomes, you know, part of you. You dominate it. it. It becomes your thing. And you wouldn't be able to enjoy God by just imagining God as this tyrant up in the sky who gives all these rules and regulations, and I'm just going to keep my head down and follow them. That's not very enjoyable either, is it? No, we, we participate in the good somehow, and this is part of what has to be clarified. So how would that happen? She goes on, and she, she's talking about different uh, things, animate and inanimate. Um, how do we rise to the level of the divine? She says, all things seek the good. And you could describe that by calling it, saying that goodness itself is that which all things desire. Um, what is that for us, then? Ultimately... This is where it's going to get very interesting. The only way that a human being can truly enjoy the happiness that God not only enjoys but is, is by participating more and more in that divine being. And that's going to be a process of becoming like God. The Greek word for this is theosis, meaning God becoming, or Godonizing, if you want to call it that. 
Now, what would that actually mean for us human beings? This is the last thing that we need to think about with respect to this, this particular set of goods. Does it mean that we would become, in fact, self-sufficient? Should we try to be like God by mastering everything that we come across, perhaps through technology, perhaps through becoming a tyrant and dominating everybody else? But that's not how God does it. God is connecting all these unities together. We just saw that going after power by its own sake is not actually going to make us happy, and it's actually self-defeating in the process. How could we be like God? Well, what could we cultivate that would do that? This process of theosis depends on human beings developing the virtues. That also means that human beings have to get away from the vices, right? Various forms of badness that we have. You know, if we're intemperate, if we're greedy, if we're foolish. And the more that we acquire virtue, the more that we have a good that actually is stable, that can be part of this unity, that can help us to understand all those other goods and how those goods of fortune could be properly used. So we've gone a long ways. We've gone from these other goods through what we're really after with those to a proposal about what it is that happiness really consists in, namely the divine. And we come back to what does that mean for us human beings? That we need to focus on virtue as that which actually is our good and that will then cast light on how we ought to understand all of these other goods that other people seem to think are the be-all and end-all. 